the word and the edification and encouragement it gives us. Lord, open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law, even out of these difficult passages, Father, humanly speaking, called the minor prophets. Bless us tonight So look at the book of Joel in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you have not turned in your homework for Hosea, that is due tonight. Uh, you actually have been given a week of grace because I was out of town last week. And uh, so if you have not turned it in, if you're not sure if you've turned it or not, I can tell you because I have it. If it's still incomplete, then um, you're in big trouble, mister. Um, you can turn it in next week if you need to, but it is due tonight. Does anybody have it and desire to turn it in? Hosea, I have Miss Judy's, I have Brad Hankey's, I have Mr. James Lingerfelt's, and I have Summer Pools. I have Mike Carpenter's done in crayon. <laughs> All right. All right, uh, is yours done? Yes, sir. Okay. Please make sure your name's on it so I know who I'm laughing at when I grade it. Thank you. All right, take out your notes on the book of Joel. Joel. Does everybody have those notes? Steve, do you have them? I don't know if you were here when I passed them out last time. Anybody else seen a set of Joel? I do. In my efficient hole punching method, I always print extras. And I actually have files of extras at the mission. All right, one of the things about the Minor Prophets that's very easy for us to grasp is who wrote the book of Joel? Joel, you'll find that pretty consistent through the Minor Prophets, that the name of the book is the name of the author, all right? It's not always true in Scripture, all right? Ruth did not write the book of Ruth. Ezra probably did. But uh, when it comes to the Minor Prophets, Hosea through Malachi, Ezra probably. That's a guess, yeah. Yeah, I'm, it's, not, it's not, I'm not speaking assertively, but uh, there's some feelings about those things. A lot of the history, a lot of the history of the Jewish nation uh, was believed to be cataloged and put together by Ezra. He's, he, was a, he was an incredible scribe, uh, well beyond what we grasp just in the book that is after his name. All right, once you look at Joel, first of all, of course, you understand the questions, and they are, that is your homework, and I hope that you will read the book of Joel. It's only three chapters. I sat down and read it today. It didn't take very long at all, and uh, so I encourage you to do that. Joel's name means Jehovah is God. Or Jehovah is my God. Now notice, when we take a word like Joel, now these are anglicized ideas, but the first part is Jo or Jehovah. And El is God, Elohim, all right? That's what Jehovah is God. The reverse of that Elijah is, that is the Elohim. God is Jehovah, all right, same, same idea, just the name inverted, all right, so that's just a little tidbit in your notes, bring it up at Thanksgiving, and you'll feel like you've accomplished something from being in school, all right, now, Hosea was a prophet to which kingdom, remember the division between the two, who was Hosea to, anybody agree or disagree with her, are you just going to let her talk, you agree? All right. Joel is a prophet to the southern kingdom as well. All right. He is ministering to them. He, Hosea lived in the north, but uh, Joel lived in the south. And he's a contemporary of both Hosea, Hosea and uh, Amos. I, I don't think, I was going to see if anybody corrected you, but Hosea was a prophet to the people in the north. Look at number four on my notes. I don't have Hosea in front of me. Huh? Yeah. Oh, no, no. I, I was asking Hosea. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being unclear about that. Hosea was to the north. Yes. Joel was to the south. All right. And uh, we have to infer that a little bit because he doesn't make it real clear 
in his uh, prophecy and his denunciation of different things, but there's a lot of little clues we're going to pick up on. I'm not going to take the time to read everything in your notes because you read just as well as I do, and I want you to take it home and study it some for yourself. Besides that, as you can see, there are three chapters in Job, and I have given you nine pages of notes, all right? And so if we spend all the time on nine pages of notes, when December gets here, I'll be in... Jonah, and I will be, we won't have time, all right? So some of these things I'm going to skip just a little bit. I want you to notice the occasion particularly. If you open the book of Joel, almost immediately you find out that there was a, a great plague of something that came through. What was it? All right, it was the locust, and he does mention the canker worm and these things. Go ahead and open your Bible to the book of Joel. In verse 4, immediately we get these animals, and in our English reading, it would seem that there's just all kinds of things. It mentions the palmer worm, and then the locust, and then the canker worm, and then the caterpillar, all right? Uh, but as we study it in more detail, it seems that each one of these four creatures is just the successive stages of the same animal, right? It is the the, the larva form, and then as, as he grows and matures, then he becomes the full-grown locust in the end, all right? And not a lot of, I get hung up in the detail of what exactly was. We do want to get caught up in the detail of what he caused. Whatever the canker worm and the palmer worm and the locust were, what did they produce in the land? Oh, absolute desolation. They ate everything, all right? Ate everything. And it seems that a drought followed at the same time, which threatened the whole country with devastation. You know, our government right now is shut down, and there's a glitch in the EBT system, and everybody runs out and buys everything off the shelves, and the end of the world is coming. We're not an agricultural society, though. Not. All right? Of course, we have to eat that way. But we have a lot of industry and things. But what if your whole livelihood was based on agriculture? If you didn't grow it and raise it, you didn't eat it, all right? And then the locusts come through and a drought comes through. We complain, oh, we didn't have any rain in weeks. Oh, I like it. I don't have to cut the grass. Well, you wouldn't like it if the fact that you were dependent on what was growing in the front yard for your meal the next day, it would be devastating to you. And so this, this great drought comes through. And, uh, and God uses that drought and the locusts that go with the drought to to warn his people and to judge his people and to deal with his people about uh, the sin in their life. I, I, oftentimes God will use a picture like the locust coming through as a symbol of what's going to happen in real life. And what I mean by real life is that the locusts were real and genuine, but they were representative of a human army that was going to come through and devastate the land. And we do see that happen in future years as Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon come through and do the same thing physically what the locusts did uh, agriculturally. And so God is using this locust plague to warn his people. But, but Joel is not a, a book without encouragement. Uh, there's a stern warning. If you look at your outline here just a little bit, I've given you two or three of them. And the reason why I give you two or three uh, outlines or chapter-by-chapter chapter summary is just so we can, uh, so we can grasp uh, the different ideas. I said outline, but I want you to look at the chapter-by-chapter chapter summary. Notice uh, Waddell talks about the fast, the feast, and then the fanfare. It's like stuff like that because it helps me think about the chapters if I can give them a heading. Here comes the locust, be warned, chapter 1. Yes, but here comes the breath of God, be strengthened, chapter 2. And finally, here comes the day of the Lord, rest and be glad. Uh, how many of you have already started on your questions on Joel? Anybody? All right, Miss Judy? Okay, you get an extra star by your name. All right, how many times is the day of the Lord mentioned in the book of Joel? If you look at your questions... Look at number two. Five times it talks about the day of the Lord specifically. What is that a, a reference to? What is the day of the Lord? Okay. When you know you've ever heard the expression, oh, you'll have your day. You'll have your day in court. Or you'll have your day here. That means the day when you were some vindication. 
All right, it's my day. All right, it's, 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 it's a day when my glory is declared or my innocence is declared. The day of the Lord is that all that's been going on in this world, people mocking God and criticizing him and shaking their fist in his face and doing what they want to do. His day's coming. And every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The day of the Lord is yet future. And we read about it in detail in the book of Revelation. Pastor Matt's talking about that on Wednesday night. There's a day coming where God's going to set everything right. And we understand the day of the Lord, not referring to a 24-hour day, but a period of time where God's going to express his right to rule and to reign. And he's going to crush the heathen under his feet and Christianity and those who follow Christ will be exalted, all right? That's the day of the Lord. Are you looking forward to the day of the Lord? Absolutely. It's the blessed hope of all Christians, all right? Now, there's some terror involved because we have to answer, all right? We have to answer. It's a scary thing. There's a judgment seat of Christ, and we will give an account for things. And so part of me is not looking forward to the day of the Lord. It's kind of like my daddy coming home when I know I've done something wrong, all right? I got a bad report card, or I didn't like to see him come home. Didn't I wanted him home. I just didn't want to have to deal with these issues. And uh, so uh, there's that element of it. But the other side of it is to be free from this flesh and this world and all these. To be, oh, the day of the Lord is a time of rest and gladness. And Joel talks about that five different times. Now, notice the theme at the bottom of page three. The theme of the book of Joel is the day of the Lord. We first have a day of a locust plague judgment and a latter day of Pentecostal blessing for Judah. All right? Notice this quote. There is first a judgment upon the chosen people inflicted through locust, even though this plague of locusts is not mentioned in any historical documents. It's mentioned in the Word of God, and that's quite enough for us. This is removed through fasting and intercession. The locust plague is then made the basis for a terrible day of final judgment, which will embrace all nations, and the faithful will be rewarded while their evildoers will be punished. All right, I've given you a list of, of outlines similar to what we talked about in the chapter summary. Notice the third one, retribution, then renewal, then restoration. That's what God always wants to do in our lives. Deal with the sin, renew us, and then reward us for our service. Uh, I've also given you a list of outstanding verses. Some of them are very famous uh, as you read, talking about beating our plowshares into swords and our pruning hooks into spears, there's a flip side of that in Isaiah. And uh, I think in Malachi, it talks about just the opposite. Uh, it is, is it Mike or Malachi? I know it starts with an M and I may have misrepresented it. Um, no, you're right, it is Micah. Thank you for correcting me on camera so the whole world knows. That's James Lingerfeld. He's the man. All right, yeah. It's Micah and Isaiah, I'm sorry, uh, which is the reverse of that. And uh, both of those are dealing with different things. And, uh, and then uh, 3.14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Uh, we're always looking for Jesus Christ in the book of Joel. And uh, how many of you have read Joel already? I read Joel. Good, most of you have. Because I don't, don't want to reference some of these things because I have to move so quickly through the book that I, I that if you haven't read it, you're not going to know what I'm talking about, I'm afraid. But we're always looking for what Christ or how Christ is represented in the book. And I want you to look with me in chapter 2 just for a second. Chapter 2. All right, now think what happened in chapter 1. What came across in chapter 1? All right, the plague of locusts. How severe was it? All right, he begins to go through this list of people and expressly telling these people, hey, you mourn and you weep because it's so bad. Notice it. He talks about even the drunkards need to cry. Tell your children about it. Uh, lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. That's how much you should cry about, about a woman who uh, was not able to be married because her husband died. Talks about calling the elders and the priest and calling for a fast because the land is so desolate, weeping and crying. Verse 18, how the cattle and the beast are moaning and perplexed because they have no pasture. It's one thing for you to suffer, but to see your animals and your offspring suffering and you don't have the ability to correct that for them, that's, that's a bad thing. I don't know if any of you have had the, it's hard to say privilege, it's not the right word, the experience of watching your children in the hospital and you not being able to relieve their pain or their situation, wanting to take it for me, and you're powerless. 
powerless. It's a difficult thing. It's a difficult thing. And so these daddies and these mamas are seeing their children crying because they're hungry, seeing their animals dying because there's nothing to eat. Where does, where does that kind of tragedy always drive you or should always drive you? To your knees to the Lord. That's exactly right. Have you noticed, if you remember, after September 11th, what, what was the attitude and culture of our country? No, what, how, what was the attendance in churches? Oh, it's through the roof. That's exactly right. It was. I mean, this, this pseudo-revival, and I say pseudo because the fruits of it didn't last. It didn't last very long. But every time tragedy comes in a Christian's life, who comes with the tragedy? The Lord always does. He always comes with it because it's, it's given as a means to bring you back to him. Remember, we've talked about this repeatedly, that God deals with us in a remedial way. All right? Not a punitive way. All right? The Bible calls it chastening when God deals with his people. Remedial has the idea of producing a remedy in our life. Punitive is punishment. Why does God not punish his people? Yeah, Christ already took the punishment. There's no such thing as double jeopardy with God. God has already placed the punishment for our sins on Christ. So when God deals with us in a chastening way, it's not punishing us for our sins. It is to produce a remedy in our life to correct our behavior and bring us back in the right line. You understand what I mean by that? Right? When he deals with the heathen, it's always punitive. All right? Their sins have not been paid for. They can pay for themselves, and they will for all eternity. But for you and I, God deals with us in a remedial way. So when the locusts come through, is it because God is punishing us? Is it his desire to get even with us? It's his desire to bring us in a closer fellowship. Why do you have tragedy and heartache and struggle financially and all these difficulties in your life? What's God trying to do? Bring you closer to him. Draw you into a relationship that you never would have entered into had you not had those problems come into your life. So all through chapter 1, he's encouraging them to groan and to moan and to pray and to fast and to seek God, right? When you're going through stuff, that's my advice to you. It should be yours to me, right? Don't complain and tell everybody else. Get alone and tell God. That's what he wants. That's the remedy for all of it. All right, in chapter 2, still going on a little bit about the struggles, but I want you to notice in verse 12. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me. What's that phrase there? With all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. Verse 13, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. What does the phrase rend your heart and not your garments mean? Not to be showy doing it just for men, but to be the innermost part of you. Good. That's good. There, there's a, an Eastern idiom or, or, or a cultural thing that we don't practice nowadays. But to express outrage and grief, you rip your clothes. All right? I'm sure the tailors loved it. All right? Every time somebody got mad, I got another customer. We don't do that nowadays. Clothes are too expensive. All right? Don't be ripping them. All right? But you know, to, to just even when Jesus was on trial, do you remember what the Pharisees and Sanhedrin did? They ripped his clothes. Expression of outrage. And ter- but what all of that was was just an outward show. All right? And there was a lot placed on showiness in that culture. I mean, they had professional mourners who would come to the funerals and act grief-stricken for the benefit of your family, even though they didn't know you at all. All right? Just, huh? Right, right, and they'd rip their clothes and throw dust in the air and scream and cry and fall down and roll around, and then pay me. All right, pay me. I know some people who would. <laughs> really? Well, I know some people I'd recommend for a job because they they got the drama. <laughs> yeah, they they can they can blow a situation all up. <laughs> yeah, I know some people like that a lot. All right, but God is saying, don't tear your garments, tear your heart. All right. What's he really meaning? What's he trying to say? James put it into good words. 
Don't make an outward show. Make it inward. I'm not interested in the expressions of your repentance that are outward for people to see, sobbing and crying and tears. Do right, all right? Change the heart on the inside, all right? One of the things that has been uh, the scourge of our Baptist church is that we have produced people who know how to meet a standard of outward performance but have no reality in their heart. Churches are full of people like that know how to dress, they know what's expected of them, they know the answers to the questions, they know all the hymns, they know how to sing, but there's nothing real on the inside. It doesn't last. It doesn't last. God said, I'm not interested in your outward show. I'm not interested in that. Rend your heart, not your garments. And when you do that, he says he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. One of the things we're learning at the mission is that every six months, the men and I memorize a passage of scripture and we quote it every morning or we try to quote it sometimes it's a train wreck and uh, sometimes it's beautiful it just depends on the morning and then by the time you really get the hang of it, a new guy shows up and it's the you know it's a train wreck all over again and we, we try to move on but we've been learning psalm 103 first part of it bless the lord O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name and it talks about how that uh, that as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. He knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust or dusty, as I say. And then one of the verses there says, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. All right. So even in the whole situation of dealing with us, does God get us, for the lack of a better term, for every sin we commit? No, he, he's not dealt with us after our sins. I've heard somebody put it this way, I am reaping better than I've sown. Would you agree that you are? Yeah, me too, me too. The law states that you reap what you sow, all right? And it's not only that you reap what you sow, you reap the, i got to get a color that, it's apropos. You reap the harvest of what you have sown. You understand what I mean by that? Uh, absolutely. I saw a sign on a church the other day that said, anybody can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the apple and the seeds. Because one seed produces how many apples? Yeah, hundreds, all right? Hundreds over, over the life of the tree, maybe even thousands of apples come from that. So you just don't reap what you sow, you reap more than you've sown. The Bible says that you, if you sow to the wind, you reap the, you might know what the verse says? You reap the whirlwind, all right? So you always reap more than you sowed. You always reap later, all right? No jack and the beanstalk in the Bible. If you disobey God, does lightning come out of heaven and strike you dead? No. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us that because there is long forbearance between the commission of the act and the judgment on the act, men think they get away with it. But have they got away with it? No, it's all, harvest is always later. But it's a sure thing. It is coming. And then you reap what you sowed in kind. Right? We understand that. Sow pumpkin seeds, what am I going to get? pumpkins. I'm going to get them later than I sowed them. I'm going to get a lot more than one seed. All right, why plant the seed in the ground if you're just going to get one more apple? One seed, one apple. <laughs> we'll do that. All right, we understand this, and God talks about the harvest, and he said, I'll be gracious to you. I'll not deal with you after the way you've sown. So in other words, God subverts his own law, and he gives us blessing instead of just what we've sown. Now this principle doesn't just apply to wickedness. What does it apply to? To good things. Just as true for good things. And the Bible says if you give a cup of cold water, not in Jesus' name, but in the name of a disciple, I'll not forget it. I'll not forget it. So you sow those little seeds? Are they going to come up? Oh yeah, they're going to come up. Have you ever noticed the way God works? Sometimes it goes a long period of time and it seems like he's not doing anything. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, there it is. You ever notice that? 
Have you ever considered, you know, when God was talking to the children of Israel, he told them to march around Jericho, this being the aerial view of Jericho. He told the children of Israel to march around one time a day for six days. All right? And don't say anything. Now, I don't know how long that circuit was. Jericho was a pretty big city. Chariots right on the walls. People lived in the walls because Rahab lived on the wall. Lived in the wall. All right? Walk all the way around that. Don't say anything. On the seventh day, how many times they walk around? Seven times. All right? And then shout. We get all called up. Man, the walls came to down. Yeah. But think about day three. What did y'all do today? Um, we walked around the city. You and the whole army? Yeah. What would you say? Nothing. What did y'all accomplish? Not, y'all noticing cracks? I've been doing it three days now. Any cracks in the wall? Nothing. What's that smell? Oh, that's the stuff they're throwing on me from the walls as I'm marching around, laughing at me, making fun of me, urinating on me. Oh, it's a pagan. Yeah, you know what's going on, all right? Day four. What would you do today? <laughs> Same as yesterday. Any progress? Nope. What's that smell? Same as yesterday. Just wash it. <laughs> Just wash it. Day five? Day six? What would you do today? I walked around the city. You're an idiot. Walking around the city. You've accomplished, what have you accomplished? Nothing. No sign of progress. No cracks in the walls. No trembling of the people. Throwing the same old stuff down on me. I'm making no progress. I'm sick and tired of it. Keep going. Day seven. Lap number six. <laughs> I'm hot. And I'm tired of this stupidity. One more time. And then suddenly... God does it all. Name it how many times you have to dip. On time number three, how did his skin look? Just as leprous as it ever was. Time number six, how did his skin look? Leprous as it ever was. Time number seven, how does his skin look? Like a baby, the Bible says. Like a baby. See, sometimes God puts you in the routine of round and round, and round, and round. People throwing crap on you all day, all right? All day, round and round. You're like, God, I'm accomplishing nothing. I quit. I said, just be faithful. Round, and around, dip, and dip. And then an instant, power of God shows up, and you stand back and go, oh, what? Are you, uh, just, all of a sudden, God does it. You're not forgotten. Not forgotten. He's just working on you through this experience. Working on his people through this experience. Teaching us these things. That he is that kind of God. Now notice with me, jump down. I can't deal with all of it. I really wish I could. But I want you to look at verse 25. Joel is one of my favorite minor prophets and particularly because of this truth. It's precious. God says, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Now who does that let us know sent that whole thing? God. God. They're my locust. It's my army. It's my people. I did it. That problem you have in your life, I did it. I sent it your way. I did it for pur- on purpose to get you and get your attention. And they ate everything. Verse 25, I will restore to you those years. Now, does God mean he's going to give them back the time? Is that what he's saying? What's he saying? He's going to give back the productivity of those lost years, right? He said, I'm going to so abundantly bless you in the future as to recover all that you had lost because of the locust that I sent. Now, answer me this. Why was it necessary for the locust to be sent? 
Because of the people's righteousness or because of their wickedness? Because of their wickedness. So in essence, it was their own fault that God had to send the locust. Isn't that true? It was. And he says, if you will rend your heart and not your garment and seek my face, I'll be merciful to you. I'll take away the locust. That's a wonderful thing. But he said, I'll do more than take away the locust. I'll restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. Now, how many got saved as soon as you were born? You came out a Christian. Nobody. How many squandered away and wasted a lot of time before you got saved? How many of you got saved young and still squandered and wasted a lot of time? <laughs> so did I. So did I. I. Look back at periods of my life and they just have to be locust years. That's what they were. Locust years. Wasted. Nothing productive to show from those years. Nothing. Nothing. I mean, just crumbs. Nothing. I don't like to think about it. I think about it. Nothing. God, I got, I'm, I'll be 44 in about two weeks. 44. What do I have to show for my life? What do I have to show? Well, humanly speaking, I see I live in a camper. That's, <laughs> I got some good boys, I do. That's grace. That's just pure grace. I, but humanly speaking, I don't have a lot to show for. And spiritually speaking, I'm like, Oh, it's a waste of time. Wasted time. And I went for about five, five years when I lived single because of all kinds of stupid, just, just locust years. Nothing to show for it. And God said, if you seek me, he said, not only will I take away those locusts, he said, I'll give you back the years. Not the time. Can't get the time back. But I'll make your future so productive that you'll recover all that you lost in those locust years. I don't know about you, but that's, that's a precious <laughs> promise to me that God said, I sent the locust. Now that I have your attention, you humble yourself, come to me. I'll use you so mightily that nobody even remember those years that you lost. Back to Psalm 103 that we've been memorizing. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. There's a progression there. He said, who forgiveth all thine iniquities. I'm glad he forgives all my iniquities. But he goes further. Who healeth all thy diseases. He fixes the problem that caused the iniquity. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Not only does he take away the sin, he heals what caused the sin, he pulls me out of the problem. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. He puts a crown on my head and blesses me. To what point? And satisfieth thy mouth with good things. How far? So that my youth is renewed like the eagles. That's what God does. I forgive your sin. I'll fix the problem that caused the sin. I'll pull you out of the mess you're in. I'll bless you and satisfy you and use you so much that you'll never be interested in going back there again. Like a daddy pities his children. And I want you to see that in all of the judgment that God rains down in Joel. There's a fatherliness about him that beckons his people to himself. Let me fix it. Let me restore to you the locust years. Now, I want you to notice what he says. Verse 26. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of your God, the Lord your God, which hath dealt wondrously with you. And he says it two times at the end of verse 26. And at the end of verse 27, what does he say? My people shall never be ashamed. Is there stuff in your past you're ashamed of? Yep. Stuff I don't want you to know about. I'm glad you don't know about it. Ashamed. God said, I'll use you in such a way you'll never have to be ashamed anymore. And be ashamed. That's the kind of God we serve. Picks up drug addicts, alcoholics, perverts, adulterers, whoremongers, whatever we used to be, such were some of you, the Bible says. And he has redeemed us unto himself and made us priests and kings 
and now we belong to him. And he says, that past that you're so ashamed of, I'll give you back what you lost in that period of time. Just come to me. Don't rend your garments. I'm not interested in all that outward show. No big crocodile tear sobbing. Just give me your heart. Let me have that. Yield to me. And watch me use you. Watch me use you. And then we come to chapter 3. Where God begins to talk about all that he is going to do in the latter days. And how their sons and their daughters are going to prophesy. Or is that in part of chapter 2? I may be... This is the end of chapter 2. There it is, yes. Verse 28. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and, I'll pour, and also on the servants and upon the handmaids, the slaves. In those days will I pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Have you ever seen that verse before? Yeah. Paul's quoting it. All right. Now, just a little aside. In Joel, what's he talking about? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. During what period of time? Well, when is the sun going to turn to darkness and the moon to blood? When is that going to happen? All right. Tribulation period. I don't need to get y'all's brains in gear. It's right there, all right? That's going to happen. Then he says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord in that day shall be delivered. Okay? Now, they'll be sent strong delusion, the Bible tells us. They'll believe a lie. Few will call on the name of the Lord. But Paul quotes it in Romans chapter 10 as applying to who? The Gentiles, all right? Specifically the Gentiles, but to everybody, all right? So, now I don't want to mess your hermeneutics up, Okay? But what did Paul just do? Paul quoted a verse from the Old Testament out of context. Didn't he? To make the point that when does God save and who does God save? Anybody, whosoever, whenever, all right? It's going to be true in the day of the Lord. It's true now. If you call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. But he got it from the book of Joel. Did you notice that, all right? This will not apply to some of you, and so just block it out, all right? So some of you get what I mean. There is an element called the curse of the Bible college student, where you so learn the Word of God that this portion was written to Israel, this portion was written to the Gentiles, this portion, that you rob it of the application that God wants to make to your own heart. Do you understand what I mean? Because you don't want to take it out of its fundamental context but God who wrote the book applies it in a lot of different ways a lot of different ways and so don't let your hermeneutics rob you of God applying truth to you because even God takes verses out of, out of context and uses it as he wants to and he can do that because he wrote the book <laughs> it's, it's his All right. let me show you an example of that that God used in my own life turn to Isaiah Chapter 50. I'm going to be just a little bit intimate with you here for a second, but it illustrates the truth that I want to illustrate. Thank you. I'm in chapter 50, but I want you to back up just a little bit to chapter, 20, chapter 49, verse 24. Eight years ago, my wife... Uh, left me. I was living alone in a trailer by myself. I didn't know if y'all didn't know this, but Anna does not have an 18-year-old son. I just, I didn't know if you knew that or not. She doesn't, all right? She would have probably been about seven at the time that he was born, but uh, I was living by myself. I lived by myself for five years and really struggled over the salvation of my children if the stupid things that I had done, if that was going to affect things, and if you just, all those things that go through your head, things the guys in the mission struggle with constantly, constantly. They just have their feelings awoken to the fact that, I've got kids. I ain't cared about them for five years. Now they're falling. Oh, God, help me. I need to do, you know, that kind of feeling. I get overwhelmed with those things. And one day, just in a struggle in my mind and wrestling with it, I flipped over my Bible and said, God, I've got to have some help. And I just started reading. 
It came to chapter 49, verse 24. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered? What is a lawful captive? Yeah, somebody who deserves to be a captive. It's rightful, all right? And as I looked at my situation, most of the blame was placed right where it needed to be. Me. I was a lawful captive, all right? Lawful captive. You've been in those kinds of situations, too. But thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contended with thee. I said, that hit me just like, I mean, just floored me. And my, that page of my Bible was all wrinkled up. And the tears just flowed down my face. I said, God, how are you going to do all that? I don't understand. And I looked down at verse 2 of chapter 50. In the middle of the verse is, My hand shortened it all that it cannot redeem. Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, at my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the river a wilderness. Their fish stinketh because there is no water and dieth for thirst. I clothe the heaven with blackness and I make sackcloth their cover. And God said, I'm God. I can do anything I want to do and I will save thy children. I said, thank you, God. And I went on. Right? I was working at the hospital during that time. And later on in the day, the devil began to, you know that wasn't true. You took that all out of context. That didn't apply to you, whatever. The hospital had a chapel, just a little room off to the side. And on my break, I went in there crying. I said, God, I need some help. And they had a Bible in there. So I said, I'll just go walk, up. I'll see what's in the Bible. And I walked up there, and the Bible was laying open to Isaiah 49. And I walked out and went, thank you, Lord. I'll tell you the whole story to show you that God can take his word and apply it any way he wants to, to your life. It doesn't always have to be in the context of what's being talking about. He wrote the book, and he knows what you need in the moment that you need it. And there have been times God has just lifted out a little phrase and drove it home in your heart. And when he does it, you'll know it. You'll know it. And not everybody will understand it. They will not. You notice when Mary was uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, all these things happened. The Bible says more than one time, that Mary kept all of these things in her heart. She just kept quiet. Why? Because not everybody understand them. Have you ever had something God just showed you all was so good, and you say, oh, brother James, look at this God show history. And James goes, yeah. That's wonderful. God bless your brother. A nut. <laughs> Why? I wasn't meant for him. It's between you and God. I don't show you my wife's love notes, do I? Mike, look, look at my wife wrote me. <laughs> no, it's not for you. Between me and her. Something is just between you and God. You know what you need. And God will give it to you. And nobody else understand it. It's not for them. It's for you. You encourage your heart. Now, I don't know where that is in the book of Joel. But it's in there somewhere. But what I want you to get from Joel is that God brings this period of time into their life to bring them to himself. And then when they come to him, he not only stops the plague, but he promises to restore all that they lost and to give them future blessings. Because what we read about, about our sons and our daughters prophesying and all those things, has all that taken place? No. Just a little foretaste at Pentecost in the book of Acts chapter 2. But not the whole nation of Israel. That is yet to come. And we've talked about that before, that God gives us a little foretaste of what he's going to do before he gives us the final manifestation of it. Some of you looked slightly perplexed when I said that. Okay. Well, if you don't understand, just ask me, and I'll try to, I'll try to explain it to you. I don't want to just, just be just rattling off stuff off the top of my head, and uh, you're not be getting it all. What I want you to do is to read your notes on Joel and to work on your homework. All right? We will finish it up. Uh, next week. But what I do want to give you, for those of you that are industrious, as I have done Amos and Obadiah, if you want it. But uh, I've done these already. And if you will read ahead, you will help me greatly in class because I do not have the time to give it the detailed attention that I so desire to do. 
it would probably would have been better to make the minor prophets a two semester class instead of just a one so that we can spend more time on it but the goal of the class huh I understand that but the goal of the class is not just simply to spoon feed you it is to whet your appetite for your own further study because I promise that what I give you is second and third hand I've gotten it from someone if you get into it and let God speak to your heart it'll be yours entirely okay thank you thank you all right, any questions about Joel? Sometimes we get off the academic side and we just get into the spiritual side and that's just the Lord and I just let it go with that. I don't apologize for it too much. Any questions? Sure.